Thank you, Mark. Um, and what, I think everybody can hear me okay, can't, can't you, without the microphone? Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> and uh, I, I appreciate everybody for coming out tonight, and thank you uh, for Yale for hosting me. I had a very engaging day uh, so far today with uh, faculty and students, and uh, I'm impressed at the uh, uh, level of enthusiasm and knowledge base. I don't know why I should be impressed at that at Yale, but um, with everybody keeping up with all aspects of this story, and I've been studying it full time for years now, and I'm always learning. So uh, I appreciate, again, the opportunity to visit here. I'm going to give an overview of some of the political and social dynamics uh, that I have learned as a reporter at the Press and Sun Bulletin. That's right on the uh, border of Pennsylvania. It's in the uh, southern tier of New York um, covering this and uh, some of the impacts on people um, as I have uh, written about this over the years. But first, I'm going to be right up front because people ask me about my views on high volume hydraulic fracturing and whether I'm for it or whether I'm against it or whether I think it's a good idea or a bad idea. And uh, I'll be up front in saying that I have no public opinion on that. I have not, I'm not going to uh, make a judgment based on the risks and the rewards of high volume hydraulic fracturing. But I do have a public opinion on this, and that is transparency. As a journalist, I'm all about uh, full disclosure and full transparency. Now, uh, my stories uh, with the Press and Sun Bulletin are often sympathetic to people that get the raw end of the deal, whether they're landowners or uh, people who um, are, uh, they, they're looking for information that they can't get. Um, I have, uh, I guess I would tell you, somewhat of a liberal view, of the traditional liberal view of the press. That is, the press is an agent for social change. And um, in Pulitzer's, to, to paraphrase Joseph Pulitzer's uh, ideals, is comfort the afflicted, afflict the comfortable, give a voice to the voiceless, uh, look at uh, suspiciously and skeptically at concentrations of wealth and power and rake the muck. So th that is kind of an old school principle, pre-Fox News, and Joseph, principle, uh, Joseph Pulitzer, of course, uh, was back in the Gilded Age, the days before Union, uh, the days when there was a big division of class, and that's kind of how the, the press has operated for a long time. So uh, that often makes me antagonistic to companies, or sometimes it puts me on the same side of the fence as the anti-fracking activists who are looking for information. But I have not closed my mind to the idea that corporations do, can and often do uh, work in uh, good public faith, good public consciousness, and uh, obviously um, free corporate enterprise is a huge important uh, part of our freedom. Now, uh, with that out of the way, um, I'm going to just briefly go over uh, uh, just a few things that probably most people are familiar with already, so I'm not going to spend much time. Thank you. Um, this is the uh, footprint of the Marcellus Shale, and one reason this is such a big story is that this is a big uh, carbon reserve, uh, a world-class carbon reserve, uh, that is now accessible in a part of the world where it never was previously, uh, and it covers a, a, a huge area of four states. Um, and then this is uh, the drilling fairway, um, the high prob probability drilling fairway. This is the area where the um, prospects are most uh, um, promising for development, and that's in the area extending down from uh, West Virginia going up through uh, the Catskill region of New York. This is the Utica Shale, uh, which is uh, underneath the Marcellus. It covers an even larger footprint, and this is uh, the source for uh, a lot of the uh, resources that you're seeing coming out of Ohio now. It's relatively unexplored in upstate New York and in Pennsylvania, um, but it's an important aspect of the story uh, because there's not only one carbon reserve, there's two, and in some areas, uh, when you combine these with conventional um, conventional uh, reserves, then you have something called stacked horizons, 
and this makes it especially, uh, uh, especially promising for a company that is exploring because they can tap one resource while, uh, one horizon while exploring others. Now here's an example of stacked horizons in uh, upstate New York. Um, and as you can see, they're both conventional and unconventional uh, resources underneath here. Now, um, you probably have been following the story. You know that uh, drilling is well off and underway in Pennsylvania where there's about 10,000 Marcellus shale wells, unconventional shale wells um, that are uh, drilled or have been permitted. And in New York State, nothing at all has happened. So uh, how did we get here? Uh, how did we, they both share the same geology or similar geology. They both sit over the same valuable resource. How did we get to a point where one state is actively producing it and the other state nothing has happened? And this has a lot to do with the politics. It has to do a lot with the perception. And I'm going to take you back to uh, the beginning of the shale gas rush in the Marcellus area, which was 2006, 2007, that happened very quietly. The mainstream media certainly wasn't paying attention. Range Resources was de were developing wells in southwestern Pennsylvania and keeping the information relatively propri proprietary. Um, and in 2007, uh, Cabot Oil and Gas also started drilling some wells in northeastern Pennsylvania. And uh, some other companies got onto the play. And it started, uh, meanwhile, uh, another very important fact, uh, fact in this is the price of natural gas was climbing. This uh, was a big incentive for more aggressive exploration and development. And uh, again, I, I'm not going to go too far into the, the uh, difference between the conventional and unconventional uh, plays, but it, it made the economics of exploring and perfecting the high volume slick water frack more viable because uh, drilling an unconventional well is uh, a fairly capital intensive and risky concern. It's less ris risky now as more come online and they develop the technology. But back in 2006, 2007, 2008, it was. They uh, were essentially able to use a lot of the technology that was pioneered down in Texas in the Barnett Shale and transpose it to uh, the scenarios up in, uh, up in the Marcellus and the Appalachian region. So we're back to the question about why did uh, things start taking off in Pennsylvania and uh, why not in, in New York? Um, well, they did start to take off in New York in 2008 with land prospecting. And this is when people were realizing that they could, uh, uh, they could develop an unconventional well with good success in Pennsylvania. And the price of natural gas was high, so they started leasing up land. And the land leasers came to south, uh, the southern tier of New York. And they got together. Uh, the, some farmers were, um, they formed a coalition because there was a lot of landmen at the door. And the coalition was intended to try to leverage bargaining power with the, with the landmen. And we didn't know much about this at the newspaper. This was all going on. It was unreported until uh, I, I did know some of the farmers. Farmers came in. And one day, a group of these farmers uh, leased 50,000 acres. One of these coalitions leased 50,000 acres with a company called XTO Energy that's now owned by Exxon Mobil uh, for $110 million. Now these farmers, many of them, almost all of them, made more in that one deal than they would see in a lifetime. And everybody started paying very close attention. This became, uh, it was just, before this happened, shell, our natural gas development was one of many stories I was covering. After this happened, it became the story. Everybody was very excited about shale gas. They saw it as uh, clean energy, uh, national independence, an economic driver. There was, nothing, uh, there was nothing not to like about shale gas development. Now, um, there was also a lot of questions, though, that people uh, brought up. This was, I will mention, 
two years before Josh Fox made fracking a bad word. So uh, what happened? Okay, we have the uh, June of 20, 2008. Everybody's excited about a $110 million deal, but everybody was asking questions. And these questions arose not with an anti-fracking movement, but with the townsfolks, uh, with uh, public safety workers, with uh, zoning people. Um, they wanted to know what, the, with transportation people, with roads and highway people. They knew this would be on a different scale suddenly. They knew it was different from the conventional types of gas drilling they had seen, and they wanted answers. So they went to the Department of Environmental Conservation, or more precisely, the Department of Environmental Conservation came to them. That's the state agency, uh, regulatory agency in New York, uh, to try to answer these questions. And I'm going to read a, an excerpt from my book here, Under the Surface, that just characterizes the scene and what I think was a pivotal moment in New York's history uh, in terms of its energy policy. And it started at a town hall meeting. And the meeting was with uh, Linda Collard, a representative of the DEC, and um, several other people, a member of the Farm Bureau, and some other people that were on the panel that would try to answer questions. They sat in front of several hundred residents, suburbanites, farmers, and officials from the town, county, and state governments who packed the public hall beyond capacity. The meeting was also streamed online. Collett ran through a PowerPoint presentation of how Marcellus development would proceed using information and photographs from conventional plays in upstate New York. She paused on a slide showing a lush meadow of wildflowers and grasses with a bank of trees in the background. This was a reclaimed natural gas site, she said, and an example of the expected long-term impact from Marcellus development. I recognize the slide from a DEC display two years earlier when I was covering public hearings on a proposal by the Office of Mineral Resources to lease the mineral rights of state forests in the southern tier in central New York. Marcellus prospecting had yet to become a public phenomenon, and there had been no mention of shale gas at those meetings. Nonetheless, Prospects of any kind of drilling on state land drew fierce opposition from outdoor enthusiasts ranging from hunters to hikers. At these hearings, Jack, Jack Dahl, director of the DEC Bureau of Oil and Gas Regulation, set up a display with, a colleagues, with his colleagues pitching clean, well-organized drill sites, including before and after landscape depictions. The display had included the photograph that Collard now showed, and Dahl had given a similar assessment that the impact from gas development due to the, quote, well-established regulatory program, end quote, and, quote, rigorous permitting process, end quote, of the agency would be minimal or even environmentally beneficial over the long term. The crowd at the Shenango Town Hall was skeptical. People fired questions at the panel before college presentation was over. A person in back stood up and asked how local emergency responders could prepare for a spill, fire, or explosion when the industry did not fully disclose the complete chemical content and concentrations of fracking fluids. Collard, Collard looked at the other members of the panel to see if they might want to take a crack at that one. They looked back at her expectantly. We don't anticipate any significant emergencies, she said after a pause. These things are rare. Another person stood up and asked how regulators were prepared for an influx of drilling that would exceed any historical comparison. Collard responded, We've been doing fine so far, no problems. She returned to her PowerPoint and was interrupted again by a person who noted that incentives for roadside dumping would go up as waste increased faster than the options for treatment. How would the agency handle that? You have landowners out there. You have neighbors out there. We would hear about it, Collard said. Hopefully, the operators will be responsible. More questioning along the same lines followed her presentation, and she delivered the same answers. Flowback is classified as an industrial waste and therefore requires a permit for transport, she said again. And again came a question, where does it go? I can't answer that, she said. It's all regulated, she added. So this was the type of uh, response, for the record, that the DEC was giving to residents, and residents became skeptical. Again, these were not anti-fracking activists. There were people looking for answers. And I think this illustrates uh, the attitudes and the level of preparedness of the regulatory agency in New York 
um, at that time, which was essentially nil. Um, now, as I said, I was working for the paper. I was covering this and other similar meetings. And after this particular meeting, Collard was on the record. It was streamed online. A lot of these reports, the, her comments, uh, as quoted here, were reported in the newspaper. And the next day, I got a call from the governor's office saying that the next meeting, because they were having these meetings on a weekly basis throughout the area where, uh, where leases that, that had been leased up, um, the next meeting that some of the DEC's top officials, not just the mid-level bureaucracy, but the top officials would be down to address the problem. And the, the long story short, um, Judith Ank, who was uh, governor's uh, top uh, administrator and um, uh, environmental advisor at the time came to the next meeting. And Judith Ank is a lifelong career activist. She had worked at uh, in, um, New York State Public Research Interest Group and other things before she got in politics. In other words, she came up through, she didn't come up through the rank and file DEC. She was an activist and a political appointee. She came to the next meeting and it was a packed auditorium in another town and uh, this, she addressed similar questions and her answers were, these are really good questions. We're glad you're asked. You should hold our feet to the fire. We will get good answers. Within two weeks after that, the Patterson's administration issued a moratorium. It wasn't technically a moratorium. It was just saying we won't issue permits on this until we have done a full environmental review. That environmental review was supposed to take a year. It ended up taking another year. Now Josh Fox's movie came out. The anti-activist establishment gained a foothold, and they essentially made New York the centerpiece of anti-fracking, uh, uh, the anti-fracking movement. Now, there's one other very important element here, uh, and it, it goes back, I'll just go back to, um, oops. This slide here, you can see the Catskills of New York, you can't see it real well, but up and around here, is the, uh, is the uh, Delaware River uh, basin and several reservoirs that feed New York City's uh, watershed. And this is one of the uh, desirable areas of drilling. And at that point, people were very anxious about the prospects of sh any type of uh, gas extraction from a watershed that feeds New York City. This became a very political issue. Um, and um, in subsequent drafts of this environmental review, they said that they would not allow drilling in this watershed, but that opened up all sorts of issues. Well, if it's not safe enough for one watershed, why is it safe enough for another watershed? It also opened up issues of when you take off a section, uh, regulate a section of land, privately owned land, and say you can't develop your, exploit your mineral rights, people can say, well, what is the government to tell me what I can and can't do with my land? This is called um, a takings claim in legal terms that the government can't take away your rights, or if they can, they can be challenged for it. Okay, this is the slide I uh, used to depict <coughs> before frack was a bad word and what wasn't to like about it. And there's still many people who feel strongly about this, of course, um, they, they, they uh, and again, this gets to the polarizing point, um, and we see this obviously in the last presidential uh, race and debate. Um, one thing the two candidates had in common is they both seemed to very much like the extraction industry, uh, not just uh, natural gas and fracking, although uh, Obama listed that as a priority in his energy plan, but um, uh, all extraction in terms of all energy. Uh, the reality is we need energy, and we, uh, other countries, developing countries in particular, need energy even more than we do. Uh, this is actually the slide that Linda Collert used in her presentation to show what uh, shale gas development would look like. This is a conventional well in western uh, New York uh, over the Trenton Black River um, formation. So the DEC, our regulators there, were holding that up as shale gas development, and it really showed that they may have known that it looked differently than this. If they did, they weren't letting on, or maybe they just didn't know. 
Now, this takes us to Pennsylvania. And uh, Pennsylvania, the cultural uh, differences of Pennsylvania are, are tied in with the history uh, and legacy of the extraction industry. And I bring up Pennsylvania because throughout the book and throughout uh, actually this national debate, debate, the theme is that there's this polarization. And Pennsylvania is really uh, a state that represents the state that went ahead and said, this is good, we need to do it, although obviously within Pennsylvania there, there's debate as, as there is within New York. But New York is, ex exemplifies, I think, the state that says, we can't do this, it's too risky. The, the history in Pennsylvania is uh, land uh, exploitation, um, m the long mining, mining legacy, obviously, the anthracite coal mines in Pennsylvania, um, the uh, modern uh, petroleum industry was founded in Pennsylvania in the mid-1800s um, with the Drake oil fields in western Pennsylvania. There's a long legacy there. Uh, quarrying, uh, timbering, um, obviously the, the tolerance level and the expectations of living in, with uh, the extraction industry in Pennsylvania is more like it is in Texas, where people have been around it for a long time. Um, this is the Knox mining disaster uh, when a uh, mining company uh, went too close to the, uh, the basin of the Susquehanna River. It broke through, um, the water poured into the mine shafts, and uh, 12 miners died. I guess I, I raise this as just the, one of the examples of the risks of the extraction industry that people live with. I mean, mining is a hard, difficult uh, uh, business, um, but it's also the industry on which the Industrial Revolution was built. I mean, uh, we could go on about uh, the mining in coal. You have Centralia, Centralia where you still have uh, a fire burning underneath the town. The town was abandoned uh, because of the coal seam fire. Um, there's a legacy, in other words. There's acid mine uh, discharge. But this is the price of a lot of the modern conveniences that we now take for granted. And I think that one thing that really has struck me with all this is we love the conveniences that the extraction industry affords us or has afforded us and our, and our ancestors. Um, flip on a uh, switch, fire up the, the, the gas, um, fire up the heat. Uh, all these things are wonderful as long as we don't have to look at it too closely. And uh, in New York State, certainly, uh, in a lot of other states, we haven't had to look at it too closely. But now with the shale gas industry covering such a large geographical area in the Northeast and other areas, we're really forced to take a good hard look. And I think that's important. Here's the Drake oil fields uh, back in the mid-1800s in western Pennsylvania. Now, I think that was a time before uh, um, uh, cumulative impact, I think that's the word. Uh, that you hear in a lot of policy documents now. I don't think they knew about cumulative impact back in the Drake, or at least they didn't articulate it that way. They weren't too concerned about it. Okay. Now, so I told you about the turning point in New York where the, the political wheels started turning to keep shale gas out of New York. I'm going to read you another part about what happened in Pennsylvania when people started to realize that maybe this shale gas development was different in the first instances when people started realizing perhaps the long-term uh, implications. Um, now, it's important to know that, and I'm going to talk about them in just a few minutes, the, the folks in, in Pennsylvania that leased their land were generally enthusiastic about it. Uh, I guess they wouldn't have re released their, leased their land if, if they weren't, um, but some leased their land at $25 an acre, and then they heard the news that right across the border in New York, that the group of coalition of farmers were leasing it for uh, $3,500 uh, $3, an acre, $4,000 an acre or more. All right, so they were saying, geez, we really missed the boat on that one. We got taken advantage of. But they were still hopeful. They were hopeful that their wells would produce uh, and they would get royalty payments. And in Dimmick, Pennsylvania, the place where I was looking, 
It's a mixed demographic, but there's a lot of poverty there. Um, and uh, a various set of characters that I talk about in the book that are impacted in various ways. But uh, I'm going to read you this uh, quick excerpt that is, is, that is a turning point there. And this is from the perspective of Pat Fernelli, who's on uh, Carter Road. From the laundry line in her side yard, Pat Fernelli had a sweeping view of the scene that would determine her future. Men and equipment had moved from the hill across the Burdick Creek Hollow to a fallow pasture directly below the house. In late September 2008, bulldozers cut through a field ablaze with goldenrod to level a pad for Gusford III. The well would draw gas from under the adjoining Farnelli land, and the family's mortgage depended on corresponding royalties. The derrick went up in early October, and soon the platform straddling the hole was busy with men in coveralls and hard hats who were lifting, swinging, and lowering pipes with hydraulics and heavy hardware hanging from chains. Shouts of men over machinery and generators carried up the valley, sometimes with the smell of heavy machinery and diesel exhaust. As work progressed, it was easy for Pat to believe destiny was working in her favor. At schools, churches, and the Lockhart lunch counter in Gas Mart, the news of landmen and their promises was giving away to the excitement of wells producing millions of cubic of feet per day from the Teal and Ely properties. There was also news of corresponding royalties. Crews were now busy building compressor stations and pipelines on the Teal land at fair compensation, she heard, and drilling other wells along Carter, well, or Carter Road. This is what Cabot's $600 million in shale gas development looked like. The size and intensity of the operation, its manic focus and energy, were all directed at producing wealth, and Pat took comfort in knowing her 20 acres were locked into the equation. Even a drop of that wealth, $3,000 or $4,000 per month, would make things good for them. They could pay their mortgage, buy horses or other animals, and make a go at farming. Her oldest daughter was getting married that spring, and they would have enough for a nice wedding. Pat would no longer have to worry about making ends meet for six dependent children with social security, food stamps, and the lousy hours and low pay Martin was getting at the Flying J Diner. And that's where he worked as a chef. The shouts from men in the drone of diesel motors and generators on October 8, 2008, a bright Wednesday morning, didn't sound peculiar to Pat. The crew had drilled to 2,000 feet still several thousand feet above the Marcellus pay zone, when they encountered a problem that brought the multi-million dollar operation to an inglorious stop. Debris from the upper layers had fallen into the hole and jammed the drill. The Devonian bedrock under Gusford III is covered by 400 feet of glacial till, unconsolidated stone and gravel known in the industry as overburden. Drilling through the till is like trying to, trying to bore through a gravel pile, and although there are techniques to deal with it, they are not foolproof. A drill that jammed somewhere in the overburden might have been less of a problem, but the Gusford crews had already worked through the till and were well into the gas-bearing zone of bedrock above the Marcellus. Gas had begun flowing, and the crews left with an open, uncased hole had no way to control it. The problem persisted throughout the fall. To Pat, it looked pretty much the same from day to day, with a round-the-clock procession of equipment and men. The yelling at the site might have been laced with a little more profanity than usual, she re reflected in hindsight, but really there was no way for, it to know, for her to know the problem would soon amount to more than a lost piece of hardware. DEP inspectors were also ignorant of complications of Gasford III until an event on New Year's Day 2009 put them on notice. A blast echoed through the hills. A mile north of the Gasford well, Concrete dust billowed from the ground and hung in the frigid air over the ruins of Norma Fiorentino's well. Norma was having supper at her daughter Brenda's home with her daughter, grandchildren, and great-grandchild. She was feeling optimistic that this year would be better than the last. Brenda's chemo treatments were keeping the cancer in check, and her granddaughter was expecting a second child. With luck, she could buy some nice baby things with royalty payments. Now, upon her return home, she stood, trying to, she stood trying to fathom the gaping hole in the shattered remains of a massive concrete slab covering her well. A random act of violence? Who would want to blow up her well? She called 911. At the Springfield Volunteer Fire Department, cordon, as the Springfield Volunteer Fire Department cordoned off Norma's yard with bright yellow caution tape, Cabot representatives arrived on the scene. They took some tests around her house and determined that any gas 
if it was there, was not lingering. And that's what uh, Norma's well looked like. Although Norma's well was soon to become famous, it was neither the first nor the worst case of methane migration related to gas drilling in Pennsylvania or elsewhere. Much of what officials knew about the danger of methane migration they had learned years before from more costly instances. The Pennsylvania DEP Bureau of Oil and Gas Management had filed files on more than 50 other cases dating from the beginning of 2004 to the time Nora Fiorentino's well exploded. All involved dangerous and sometimes fatal accumulations of gas migrating from new or abandoned wells into a closed spaces. They had happened before the shale gas rush became big news and they had gained relatively little attention. In 2004, DEP records documented the collection of gas in the basement of the Harper residence near several wells being drilled by the Snyder brothers in Jefferson County, about 80 miles northeast of Pittsburgh. On March 5th, the furnace kicked on and an explosion leveled the house and killed Charles Harper, his wife Dorothy, and their son Bailey, grandson Bailey. A report by the Pittsburgh Geological Society includes a photograph of the scene, a foundation covered by charred rubble and the shells of burnt out automobiles in the driveway. And this is a quote from that report. Although it rarely makes headlines, damage or threats caused by gas migration is a common problem in western Pennsylvania. In July 2008, an explosion killed a resident of Marion County who tried to light a candle in the bathroom. The DEP record of the event, one paragraph long, states that the agency, quote unquote, became aware of the problem after the fatality, which it linked to gas migrating into the septic system from an old gas well with deteriorating casing. The DEP files also contained some cases noteworthy for what was unknown or at least undocumented. And this is right from the file. Unknown name, Armstrong County, Southwest Regional Office, 1999. House explosion resulting in destruction of residents and one fatality. Investigation is not well documented. Mechanism of migration is an operating gas well. Pressuriza pressurization of casing, status resolved. So here's the, uh, the report. Um, that talks about the, the various uh, migrations from the DEP. Here's the photograph, it doesn't really uh, translate very well here, of the Pittsburgh Geological Society. Now, methane migration, I bring this up and, and I just wanted to make a point of this lecture because we see, we talk about Josh Fox and the flaming faucet and, and all the issues related to uh, hydraulic fracturing that he brings up in his perspective. Um, but I think people are probably might know this already, but uh, the issues related to my methane migration aren't really specifically a fracking issue, even though Josh Fox in the Flaming Faucet, he portrays it as such. Methane migration is a complicated thing, and it's not necessarily just related to, uh, it's not necessarily related to fracking at all, M maybe or maybe not. Um, it, it definitely is more related to drilling, gas drilling certainly, but it could be related to drilling a water well. It could be related to, um, it could just happen by itself. In other words, you have these methane seeps and petroleum seeps in the ground. Some are deep, some are shallow. In areas where you have a lot of carbon reserves, a lot of petroleum reserves, and a lot of gas reserves, you have a lot more methane in the ground, sometimes in concentrations. Sometimes, and the industry will like to say this, this gas gets into water wells by itself, and this is true. So it gets to be a very confusion, confusing thing because if anybody, if you, any of you have seen Truthland, you will see instances where people have testified that they could always light their water on fire. And we hear the industry say that. There's two generally types of methane. Now, I'm not a geologist and we have several geologists in the audience, so I, please uh, flag me if I go too far afield here, but I'm gonna talk about bio, biogenic methane and thermogenic methane, and this is one of the tests uh, of, of the origins of methane and, and whether methane in water wells, where it comes from. Biogenic methane is the kind related to biological decomposition in swamps and landfills. Thermogenic methane, sometimes called production gas, is created under heat and pressure in bedrock. 
So thermogenic methane, if it gets in the water, is more generally possibly a case of drilling, especially if there's been drilling in, into, um, into bedrock. Uh, there's other more specific ways, uh, technical ways, that scientists can trace methane to various layers. Um, but I guess the whole issue of methane migration is a very important issue uh, in terms of the political context of the debate because people talk about the risks and they see the flaming faucets and also the technical aspects of the debate. Um, there's some very knowledgeable people that follow this very closely and they will, uh, according to some of my sources, they'll say, yes, people talk about the risk of fracking. I'll talk more about that in the, uh, in the minute. But uh, really this methane migration is an important risk and that brings us to well casings and other issues. So just, uh, and the well casing debate is a long technical involved debate. Uh, long and short of it from my perspective is, can casings effectively uh, prevent migration of, you see when you drill a hole in the ground, obviously it's a conduit for, for methane to move up. Move up. And uh, can they prevent, can they uh, block off uh, the water bearing zones effectively over time? Now, <clears throat> so Norma Fiorentina's well changed the discussion in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And people started saying, well, geez, we didn't know that wells could blow up. And uh, we had a lot of people starting uh, to have other water problems. Sometimes it's turbidity, sometimes it's ill-defined. And this is going to get to the transparency part of it in a minute. Um, again, as a journalist, I, I feel strongly about this. It's very important to, for other companies to say exactly what they're emitting. They have all sorts of standards. Uh, if they're emitting hazardous waste or releasing hazardous waste, they have, to, uh, they have to document that and do something about it. But the drilling industry is not so because there's exceptions. So it, it gets very hard to understand, uh, to hold industry accountable when the industry has exemptions from these uh, disclosure. Uh, and and we, um, we'll talk a little bit about the Halliburton loophole. The Halliburton loophole is in the 2005 Energy Act and it essentially exempts the, the drilling industry from disclosing what they put into the ground. Um, without this exemption, the drilling industry would come under federal regulation and that would open up a, a new can of worms for the industry, uh, a higher burden for it to operate. Back to Pennsylvania in 2009 in Norma Fiorentino's well, um, residents uh, with water problems started getting together and a lot of them I talk about in the book they cut across different demographic classes there's Norma Fiorentino the Carters Ron and Jean they're second generation farmers uh, who were trying to save for retirement and expected the royalties would uh, would help them retire um, Victoria Schweitzer became actually a fairly hope uh, high profile person um, she was a retired school teacher and a newlywed, uh, and she and her husband, Jim, were building their contemporary dream home when they leased their land in seven acres. Um, it was a, a big, beautiful uh, post and beam home that uh, they, they lost their water, couldn't drink their water, and there's drilling all around them. So the drilling boom really turned into something much different than what she expected. She called themselves, uh, this group, accidental activists, because a lot of these people in Pennsylvania, they never had their name in the paper except for a birth or maybe a marriage announcement. These were not people that sought the limelight and they became, at least in New York and Pennsylvania in the early days of the fracking uh, issues, household names. Now there's other people on the other side of the fence who uh, came to the defense of shale gas and they got tired of hearing about all the problems and because they thought that it was unfair that we're, people were focusing on the problems and not necessarily the benefits. Don Lockhart, Lockhart Lunch Counter, um, who, who's right down in Pennsylvania, a local figure, sells a lot of gas, has a lot of business, and he says, you know, I'm making money off this and I'm not afraid to admit it because that's the, that's the American way. What's wrong with that? Um, I like Don, have a lot of respect for him. Dewey Decker is uh, uh, the farmer in Deposit New York that had held led the coalition that landed the big deal with XTO Energy for $110 million. And that's his farm there. Um, and 
Dewey makes a very good point that if we don't like shale gas development here, but we like our clean energy, or I should say our, our abundant energy, our abundant cheap energy, um, can, we, can we like it when it happens over in another country uh, with environmental uh, consequences uh, and political consequences, pr uh, possibly far worse than what we're experiencing here? It's a point to think about. Okay, and then, uh, so we had the people of the town board, uh, the municipal planners and the public safety people in New York, and we had the accidental uh, act activists in Pennsylvania. Then we had Josh Fox <coughs> release his gas line. That was in the summer of 2010. And um, then we had a, a national movement start, which, which gained a lot of traction in New York State. A lot of it related to the New York City water supply. Um, people cared very passionately about that and um, it kind of went national after that. Okay, uh, so where do we go from here? Couple critical things. Uh, the EPA uh, water study, um, this is something that uh, actually began with uh, a representative in the Broome area, uh, Representative Ithaca, um, Maurice Hinchy. He's retiring this year and he was behind the FRAC Act and he also was on the um, uh, Appropriations Committee in Congress and he helped fund an EPA study uh, to take a look at fracking's impact on groundwater. Now, uh, the Halliburton loophole that we talked about was predicated on a previous study under the Bush administration that looked at uh, coal bed methane and found that it did not impact water supplies. That, that study was criticized retroactively and uh, people said that it wasn't uh, reviewed properly and uh, it was too narrow in scope and even some former EPA people involved in it said they never intended it as a policy document, although I don't know how the EPA can put out something and not expect it to be used as policy. Um, so the political wheels turn, Maurice Hinchy comes on the scene, uh, there's uh, political momentum to send the EPA back or refund the EPA or recommission the, the current EPA under the Obama administration to take a look at this. They've been doing this since uh, 2010. Dimmick is one area they're looking at, um, and they're looking at other areas too. They're expected to have a progress report on, on this uh, in, by the end of this year. The, peer review, the study is supposed to be up for peer review in 2014, and you can bet there'll be a huge political influence because depending on what it comes up with, it could uh, set uh, some initiative to uh, repeal the Halliburton loophole, maybe. Is that possible? Don't know. Uh, you know, there's a lot of politics that work, there's a lot of science at work, and I like to say that um, policy is where politics meet science. And, and I think you'll have that equation coming together here with this. I mean, as we see, the Obama administration has listed shale gas development as a, uh, as a priority in the energy future. So will it be regulated by the EPA, I think, is the bigger question. And if it is regulated by the PA, EPA, uh, what will that do for the economic viability, especially if prices remain low? Gets us to the other uh, next important thing, which are markets. Um, the price is low now, uh, which is an incentive to, uh, for coal, coal uh, plants to turn over to natural gas, and that's happening in a lot of areas in Connecticut. Uh, Governor Malloy has uh, recently talked about initiatives to get a lot of the coal-fired plants onto natural gas. Uh, cleaner burning, this is open to debate now, um, but certainly less particulate matter, less mercury, uh, that's a big thing. It's hard to talk about natural gas development without factoring in coal. Um, and uh, This is a personal struggle I have a little bit when I'm thinking about, gee, Tom, what would you do? Uh, the, the, we know that renewables right now in, in, the, uh, in this global market for carbon, um, or I'm sorry, for energy, 
uh, are not at a point where they can really carry the load, and especially when you start factoring into the uh, developing countries. Um, so where are we? What, what do we do? Um, conservation is certainly important. Um, this is all something, I guess, that we're going to have to figure out over the next decade or so. Um, how will climate change influence this decision? Um, you have these competing fossil fuels, uh, natural gas and coal, um, versus the renewables. Okay, and then I'm going to just finish up here uh, with uh, this idea of home rule. This is also going to influence the industry. It's the idea that states regulate uh, natural gas development now. Um, uh, will the federal government come into play with the regulations? We'll have to see. It doesn't, you know, it depends on the EPA study. It depends on a lot of other things. But uh, local municipalities are trying to uh, regulate the industry in New York and Pennsylvania. And uh, they're saying uh, we should have some say in citing these wells. Uh, the industry should comply to local zoning, which it, it is exempt from right now. Um, New York, in fact, has banned the industry in Dryden and Middlefield under using local zoning laws. The industry said you can't do that. The state has the authority over ga uh, gas drilling. Um, and you're preempted by, uh, by um, state law. And the, the municipality said, oh, yes, sure we can. The industry took them to court. In lower court, the uh, municipalities won. And uh, that is now going to uh, appeal. Uh, similar in Pennsylvania, a very similar thing is happening. And that's before the state's highest court right now to see whether the legislation which forbids uh, or limits municipal rule on shale gas is in fact constitutional or not. The industry needs what it says is predictability and uh, um, conformity to develop a large gas play. So um, when you have local municipalities opting out, it can, it can influence that. That's just uh, in New York, at a given time, some of the municipalities that were considering uh, uh, bans or some sort of uh, regulation. Okay, I will be happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you.